Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. The uh, the topic of this uh, after hour session is uh, is the doctor's opinion, but I got to tell you, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not much for telling jokes, but they say you're supposed to start off every talk with a joke. So I'm I'm kind of I'm I'm sort of like Kevin. I was a nerd, and I so the only thing I figured I could do was I went out to the internet, and you know what I found on the internet? I found the official world's funniest joke. This was on CNN.com last week. It says, uh, uh, the bio as London, England, the world's funniest joke has been revealed after a year-long search by scientists. In an experiment conducted in Britain, people around the world were invited to judge jokes on an internet site as well as contribute their own. The Laugh Lab research carried out by psychologist Dr. Richard Wiseman from the University of Hertfordshire attracted more than 40,000 jokes and almost 2 million ratings. And here it is. Two hunters are out in the woods and one of them collapses. He doesn't seem to be breathing, and his eyes are glazed. The other guy takes out his cell phone, and he calls 911. He gasps, my friend is dead. What can I do? The operator says, calm down. I can help. First, let's make sure he's dead. There's a silence. Then a gunshot is heard. Back on the phone, the guy says, okay, now what? (laughs) I want to know who studied jokes for a year. That's kind of like, to me, like this other, this other story I also found on CNN.com. Drug reduces drinking in people who became alcoholics at early age, researchers report. Um, it's another one of those studies about these drugs that, uh, you know, supposedly make you not drunk if you drink them, uh, if you take them. And I don't know why people do all this study of these things, because what they don't get is, is that I didn't drink to not get drunk. You know, why bother? Uh, but it says, uh, I, I like what they said here. It says, alcoholic patients with an early onset of the disease, um, specifically before age 26. Um, I took my first drink of alcohol at age nine. Tend to have a broad range of antisocial behavior, including high rates of childhood risk behavior, hostility, and earlier in life drinking problems compared with people who develop alcoholism at age 26 or older, the report said. Um, the, the, I, what, what amazes me is that they've come up with this chemical compound, but then the very last two paragraphs are, are what were the kicker for me. Or actually, three. It says only two drugs have been approved in the past half century to treat alcoholism. I know what one of them is. That's uh, an abuse. It, it stop anybody from drinking? Um, although studies are underway on a number of others. Then it goes on to say, the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism funded the study, which is good to know. Providing the drug was Glaxo Welcome, a North Carolina pharmaceutical company reporting sales in 1999 of almost $5.8 billion. The company is a subsidiary of Glaxo Welcome, PLC of London. For his research projects, Krasner, the doctor who did this study, is receiving financial report from Bristol's Myers Squibb and other commercial drug firms. Go figure. You know, what they don't get is, is that I think it's uh, it's in this uh, doctor's opinion that we're talking about. Dr. Silkworth noted that uh, we drink alcohol because of the way it makes us feel. And that to me, it's almost like a useless exercise to go around trying to come up with medicines that don't make me feel that way because why do I bother? I um, wanted to introduce you all to, to, some, to, to, to a fellow. His picture's right here on the podium. This is Dr. William Duncan Silkworth. Uh, medical doctor, he was a neurologist, which means he studied the physiology of nerves. Basically, he was a psychiatrist. And um, in, in some of our AA literature, it says that he was a well-known doctor. Um, he was the medical director of Towns Hospital in New York City. Um, Towns Hospital is located or was located in lower Manhattan. Um, I believe somewhere right around like 23rd Street-ish or something like that was what I had read somewhere. Um, Dr. Silkworth was uh, basically, he, for whatever reason, he loved drunks. And there are stories that said that he treated as many as 51,000 drunks in his lifetime. Now, I want to draw an interesting parallel between Dr. 
Silkworth and, and this, this fellow who, who did the research on this new drug, his patient study was consisted of 321 patients in the first screening, of which 158 completed the 12-week study. We alcoholics tend to finish everything we start um, because drinking, not drinking was not a requirement in, at the entry to that. But anyway, Dr. Silkworth created about 51,000 alcoholics. You would think that after that amount of time, he might have noticed a thing or two about us. Um, and it broke his heart to see alcoholics get drunk. Um, when he died, Bill Wilson, in his eulogy of Dr. Silkworth, said that he thought, he, he wasn't sure, and he probably figured that Dr. Silkworth would be a little mad to hear this, but he thought that God gave Alcoholics Anonymous to Dr. Silkworth as a reward for all the work that he did treating alcoholics. Um, he, he had a special place in his heart for drunks. He loved drunks. Um, there, there's a, there's a, you might ask, you know, what, why are, do we have a couple of alcoholics up here talking about doctor stuff? Um, because I am not a doctor, although I certainly medicated myself as one for many years. I am not a lawyer, although I got here one with me. Um, he's a darn good one, too, let me tell you. Um, but I, I found something. I don't know if you all have ever seen this book, um, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous Comes of Age. If you haven't read the other AA literature, you're kind of missing out on stuff. And AA Comes of Age was written in, what, about 1950, I guess, at the time when we adopted the traditions and the foundation was basically turned over. The, the, the operations of Alcoholics Anonymous was turned over to Alcoholics Anonymous from the Alcoholic Foundation before that period of time. They had always had one more non-drinker, non-alcoholic on the board than alcoholic on the board just in case we all got drunk. And, you know, you can imagine what a mess that might be. Um, so, anyway, this this book came out, and, and there's a bunch of neat stuff. Bill talks in a lot of depth about talking with Abby, his, his, uh, the day that he and Abby got together. Um, but he talks in here, he says, uh, I like this, it says, it, it, this sort of explains to me why, why it might be helpful to have alcoholics talking about what the doctor's talking about. He says, um, Complete hopelessness and deflation at depth were almost always required to make the patient ready. And both uh, Dr. Young had noticed that and some other doctors, some other psychiatrists had noticed that we had a little bit of an ego streak running down our back. And that it wasn't until we, we had complete deflation that we were willing to possibly recognize the fact that we had a real problem. Um, and that was exactly what happened to me. Uh, uh, then Abby as an alcoholic, and handed me the identical dose. In other words, an alcoholic walked in and said, until you give up, you ain't going to get it. And he laid it on the table and he said, this is what's wrong with us. On Dr. Silkworth's say so alone, maybe I would have never completely accepted the verdict. But when Abby came along and one alcoholic began to talk to another, that clinched it. Okay. The, the magic combination was the medical doctor said, guys, you are doomed. And then the drunk said, and this is what we did to get there. You know, and, and I don't know if you all could relate to Kevin tonight, but man, I could. I, I was drinking a quart of Evan Williams a day when I got here. But I wasn't an alcoholic because the alcoholic was the guy across the street from me. Literally, I watched the man die of alcoholism. He lived directly across the street. I lived in a condo complex in Smyrna, and this man came home every night. He sort of swerved his car into the driveway and he walked in with his brown bag. I wasn't an alcoholic because I carried my bottle into the house inside my briefcase. I wasn't an alcoholic. Um, in 1935, excuse me, 1934, um, in, in the summer of 1934, and many of us have seen this scene played out in My Name is Bill W., the wonderful, the wonderful uh, story. Uh, with James Woods and James Garner, um, Bill Wilson gets 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 the treatment. He gets the medicine from Dr. Silkworth. So about the middle of the summer of 1934, I lay in Charles B. Towns Hospital on Central Park West. Okay, so it's a little further uptown. I had been there before. I met dear old Dr. Silkworth. He had thought he had thought at one time that I might recover. He thought every one of the 51,000 drugs that he was treating could recover. 
but it broke his heart every time one of them died of alcoholism. But I had, been, I had gone steadily downhill, and now I lay upstairs in the hospital knowing for the first time that I was utterly hopeless. Lois was downstairs, and this kind old doctor was trying in his gentle way, he was a very gentle man by all reports, to tell her the bad news that so many wives and husbands had received. He was trying to tell her that what was wrong with me was that I was hopeless. And Lois was exclaiming, but Bill has a tremendous amount of willpower. You never saw such an obstinate man when he sets his heart on something. He has tried desperately to get well. We've tried everything. Doctor, why can't he stop? The gentle little man explained that my drinking, once a habit, had become an obsession, a true insanity that condemned me to drink against my will. And she said, Doctor, what can we do? So he had to tell her that I would be, I would have to be locked up, go mad, or die. Upstairs, upstairs I knew the story. It was the end of the long road. It was the end of the long road. And that's what I, that's what I was faced with on December 2nd, 1990. You know, my ex-wife found some bottles. I could really relate to, anybody see Lost Weekend with Ray Milan? Yeah. That's one of my favorite movies now. I love that movie because, See, I hid bottles. I hid bottles from myself. You know, my my wife would go out of town for a week, and I first thing I'd do is I'd hide the bottles. You know, like what's she going to do? Walk in the door? Um, in in the fall of 1935, we 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 all know the story. Bill gets visited by Abby Thatcher, brings in the message of the Oxford groups. There's really a neat story in here. I'm not going to read it because we don't have the time, but. There's a great story about Bill visiting an Oxford group meeting. Actually, Sam Shoemaker, who was head of the Oxford groups, in uh, a, a mission in uh, in downtown New York. Um, it's the kind of place that I thought Alcoholics Anonymous was. My vision of Alcoholics Anonymous was always the three-penny opera kind. Um, that is, a guy sitting around in the trench coat, sitting on the benches. Um, anyway, there's a great story about that. But Bill basically realizes in this at this mission meeting that, that there might be some spiritual help and that the message that Abby had given to him a few days earlier started to sink in. So Bill goes on his last drunk, and it's quite a debauch. He ends up, he's supposed to be going to play golf with a guy. He ends up getting home with his head cracked open, leaning against the door grate of the home. Lois opens the door. He's standing there with a strap to his golf bag, and that's all that's left. He was supposed to be going to play golf. Right? So so he did just like I did. He said, man, there may be something wrong here. So, so he says, and he realized, he says, alcoholism, not cancer, was my illness. But what was the difference? Was not alcoholism also a consumer of body and mind? Alcoholism took longer to do its killing, but the result was the same. So if there was a great physician, and that's what he had heard from Evie, who could cure the alcoholic sickness, I had better seek him now at once. I had better find what my friend had found. Would I, like the cancerous sufferer, do anything to get well? If that required me to pray at high noon in the public square with other sufferers, I would follow my pride. Would I swallow my pride and do that? Maybe I would. Meanwhile, though, I would go back to Towns Hospital where Dr. Silkworth would sober me up again. You know, somebody fix me. Somebody fix me. Then I look, could look clear-eyed at Debbie's formula for sobriety. Perhaps I would need an emotional conversion. Maybe a conservative doubter like me could get by without having to do anything like that. Always looking for that out. Anyhow, I started the hospital. Walking up Clinton Street to the subway, I fished six cents out of my pocket. A nickel would get me to the hospital. But I hadn't, forgot, hadn't I forgotten something? Here I was on my way to get cured. Typical alcoholic that I was, I figured I might as well get comfortable until the hospital took over. So I stepped into a grocery store where I had slim credit. I remember explaining to the clerk that I was an alcoholic on my way to be cured. Could I have four bottles of beer on the cuff? Can you imagine that? Walking to the grocery Hey, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm about to go get cured. Can I have four bottles of beer? I drank one bottle on the street and another in the subway. My spirits rose as I offered a third to a passenger. God almighty, I've been on the New York subways, and I've been offered a beer before. He turned down my refreshment, so I drained that bottle on the station platform next to the hospital. Holding the last bottle of the neck, I walked into towns where Dr. Silkworth met me in the hall. Now, in very high spirits, I waved the bottle and shouted, At last, Doc, I've found something. Even through my haze, I could see the good old man's face fall. I know now how much he loved me. This fresh outburst really hurt him. 
I tried to explain the new thing that I thought I had found. He looked at me, shaking his head. And after a while, he quietly said, Well, my boy, isn't it time you went upstairs and went to bed? Dr. Silkworth had an incredible patience with, dr- uh, with, uh, with drug addicts and alcoholics. He treated both. He, he saw that the whole mess, he, he identified, he was one of the first medical doctors to identify the fact that alcoholism is an allergy. We were talking about that driving over here tonight, uh, this afternoon, um, as, as we came, as we were coming over. When I was a kid, I grew up with uh, hay fever. I had, a, and, and actually, Dr. Silkworth, in one of his papers on this, one of his medical papers, talked about how people who suffer with hay fever can go years and years and years without being affected by whatever the substance is, like that yellow stuff that we always have in March when we're down here or whatever. You know, years and years and years, and all of a sudden, just like that, it triggers and it goes off. He says the alcoholic is the same way. He says he doesn't know why the alcoholic... Some people have the manifestation of the allergy at the very onset. Some people go for years and years and years, and then they cross that red line. And he really didn't understand it, and in fact, they have done some studies since that have talked about the metabolism and, and how... how um, alcohol turns into, what is it, uh, I think Joe and Charlie said it turns into formaldehyde? Acetone, thank you, in our bodies. It breaks down. There's a chemical process that it breaks down. And what happens when it breaks down is it sets forth an allergic reaction. And that re- allergic reaction in the alcoholic is the craving for more alcohol. Um, my favorite, one of my favorite buddies in the fraternity house when I was in college was a guy who used to say to me, let's go up to Spiro's, which is the local bar near, near campus. He said, let's go up to Spiro's and have a beer or ten. <laughs> I can honest to God remember the one time in my life that I know for a fact I took one drink. And that was the night when my wife had been on a business trip to, to Washington, and I had come up for the, on Friday to visit. We were going to do the tourist thing, right? And so we were going to this nice dinner at the hotel Friday night, and she says, just have one drink. And I was cornered. I, I, I had no out. I couldn't just slip away and get something. I had the one drink. And it was a miserable night. A miserable night. I never drank one drink. Like I said, when I got here, I was drinking Evan Williams by the court. That is not social drinking. And, and I drank it sitting on my sofa by myself. I was, I was not a bar drinker towards the end except when I would go down to like places like the Cheetah Three and talk to the ladies about God and stuff dollar bills in there. But that's, that's another, that's a, that's a different fifth step. <laughs> Dr. Silkworth wrote a series of medical papers. He wrote two papers in 1937. Um, one was published in March and one was published in April. The one published in March is titled Alcoholism as a Manifestation of Allergy. And then the other paper is titled Reclamation of the Alcoholic. And basically, he talks about the two parts of the disease. He says, basically, alcoholics are have an allergic reaction to alcohol, and that the only solution to that is to not take in any alcohol. You know, if we were just normal people, that would that'd be just fine, you know. Don't drink. You'll be okay. The problem is, is that he also observed as a psychiatrist that there's an obsession, that we're also obsessive types. We also tend to be manic depressive types in general, um, basically we're crazy. And that the one thing that our disease tells us is that we don't have it. And he noticed that almost in every alcoholic, we don't have it. And he said the only solution to that whole mess is what they called at the time moral psychology. Now, that's a goofy sounding set of words, but basically morals, if you hadn't heard this before, you know like on the, in the steps we talk about in the morning, it says we took a fearless and searching moral inventory. Morals have to do with man's relationship with God, spirit. And ethics has to do with man's relationship to man. If you ever wondered where that comes from, that's sort of the difference. Ethics is how we deal with each other. Morals is how we deal with God. So when he talked about moral psychology, he was going way out on a limb. Because here is a medical doctor. He hasn't got any pills that he can give us. He hasn't got any, any of this transformation, any of this stuff that uh, Carl Jung had come up with or that Freud or any of these guys had come up with. He couldn't fix us. 51,000 alcoholics, he couldn't fix us. He said the only solution that he'd seen was in a few alcoholics that had found spiritual help. They had had a psychic change. And that was his observation as a medical doctor. And that's what he talks about in the second paper. Um, these two papers, written in 1937, then were sort of 
trimmed down into a single paper published in 1939, also about the alcoholic, which then became the basic text for the doctor's opinion in the, in the, uh, in the front matter, the XXIIIIVIIV stuff in, in the big book. By the way, if you're doing a book study on this stuff, there's, there's a caveat, there's a gotcha. I didn't realize this until I started doing a book study with some guys this year, that when they, in the fourth edition, they had a forward, which throws off all the XXIVII stuff. So if you say, well, we're on XXVIII, and he's on a different page. So it just, it's, it's just to be careful, because it does change, you know. They say the first 164 pages of the big book don't change. Well, yeah, they do a little bit, but the basic ideas are still there. Um, I want to close with this. I shared about it in the, um, the early bird meeting, but I'm going to offer it to you all because it's been a tremendous gift that was offered to me. Last spring when Scott Lee was here, he, uh, he, 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 I don't know if you all heard it, but he said, he, he made a great suggestion, which I took home and I grabbed hold of, and that for me was read two pages of the big book every day. Now, I get, I, you know, I'm like most alcoholics. I get all charged up. I'm going to read them. Well, most of the time I'm sitting here reading 449, I'm reading the, my favorite page 25, I'm reading all this stuff. And, you know, somewhere around we agnostics, I start to forget the fact that I had made this commitment to, to, to read the big book again. So he said, read two pages a day. Well, I made the decision that I was going to do that. Now, Dr. Silkworth in his paper on the reclamation of the alcoholic draws the difference between making a decision and um, making a pledge or, or you know, just, you know, we make all these promises and things. And what I had made was a promise to myself. I made a decision that part of my recovery was going to be two pages of the big book every day. Let me tell you what happened as a result of that. First of all, I'm on my third pass through the big book. And I, there's stuff that I didn't know was written in there. That's amazing. And every time you read it, I think there's more stuff. But more amazingly, is this, I was asked to be part of a book study at a halfway house. And I've met some of the most interesting people I've ever met before. And, you know, the one thing that I guarantee you, you will get by teaching the big book is you will learn the big book. And one day at a time, you'll get the opportunity to stay sober today. That's the reward, is to stay sober today. I'm going to turn the podium over to my good friend, Jewel. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the doctor's opinion. He's going to go into some detail about some of the papers that Dr. Silkworth wrote and some of the some of the material. I think you're going to... He's going to go at it. He's going to talk about the big book. And then, after all of that, we're going to break up into some groups and we're going to do some book study on this whole stuff, okay? Thanks for letting me share. I tell you what, boy, it's hard to follow a straight man. Them darn dot com is about to take over everything. Uh, my name's Jewel. I'm an alcoholic. And, uh, Talk about the uh, doctor's opinion in the context of book study. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about who Dr. Silkworth was, and uh, Mike went out and did some real good research on uh, Dr. Silkworth. And as, as a matter of fact, those two papers that he found, I didn't, I, I really didn't know they existed until he uh, showed them to me in our research and prepared for this. So um, it's, it's amazing um, all of the background and contextual stuff that kind of fits in with what's going on here. Uh, and even uh, Bill Story and the and the uh, the Oxford group and the Ebby Thatcher stuff, all of that happened on the way to the first publication of the Big Book. All of that kind of stuff just kind of rolled up historically into when they got down to the point where there were a hundred recovered alcoholics that had come to ask Dr. Siltworth to contribute to the Big Book. And what you see. Um, Big book with them two pages you read every. Yeah. This, uh, what 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 you see when you get uh, to Doctor Silkworth? Uh, I, I do a book study every Thursday at Grace Recovery, and uh, I always say in, in in the big in the book study there is that we go only as fast as the slowest man, which means I spend a lot of time in the table of context, table of contents of the big book, showing how the big book is structured. The big book is structured 
in a very in a very cool kind of way for 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 an alcoholic. And if you look at the the structure of the contents, you see the preface, and then you see the forwards. And I always uh, explain that as far as a, a kind of historical stuff, telling you where how we got to this point. You know, every every book with a forward tells you how we got to this point. We now have four editions uh, of the big book, so we got four forwards. And the most recent forward talks about uh, internet meetings and things of that nature. And and uh, the, and and when the first forward was written, we hadn't even gone to the moon yet. They talked about how amazing it would be to do that kind of stuff. But now we have digital uh, meetings, we have uh, e-meetings, we have all kinds of stuff that's just following the times. And by the time the big book is published the fifth time, there will be something else um, there that wasn't there when, uh, when, 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 when the fourth edition was written. Then after uh, the, uh, the forwards, the first thing you see is the doctor's opinion. And I always point out that the doctor's opinion, in my humble um, estimation, is the first definitive definition of what alcoholism really is about, the mechanism of alcoholism. And that's real important. Um, you know, if, 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 if you are going to diagnose an illness, you have to first define what the illness is. Okay? And then, right after that, in the big book, and we'll go back to Dr. Siltworth's opinion, but right after that is the clinical uh, example of how you then go about diagnosing the illness that you defined in the doctor's opinion. And... uh uh, so, so, and, and, and just talking about the big book and, and what we're trying to do is um, encourage uh, the study of the big book and uh, encourage um, sharing what we find out about the big book. A, a lot of things happen out here at Rock Eagle, and one of the things that happen out here, this is a workshop, number one. Um, it's a workshop, and uh, we come out here to learn how to work. You know, we learn how to share our work when we go back. Most of us want to hurry up and go back and uh, get back to town and get to our little meetings with, you know, with the three sick people in, on the side and get them all straightened out, you know, by Thursday. You know what I mean? And that's all well and good. But if somebody going to want to know the real deal, and they're going to want to know from you. Okay, see, see, one of the special things about the men that end up out here in the woods with us um, twice a year is that you, you're probably some of the most, most enthusiastic and committed recovering people in your sordid communities about the country. Uh, most people look up to you, um, or look over at you. However, you know, my sponsor, my sponsor sponsor back in the day, Mr. Jim Pearson, would always say, look over at you, not up at you, because we, you know, we don't do good at looking up and down. Looking over is pretty cool. Uh, uh, but look over at you and want, you know, they'll know you done been exposed to some stuff, and they're gonna want to, want you to help them, and you gotta help them right. Okay? And part of this, Help and right thing is looking at the big book, being able to know some context, understand some things about it, and and uh, in the series that we're going to try to introduce to you over over a period of time is various chapters in the big book and where they sit and why they sit there, you know. And right in this this particular uh, time, we're going to be talking about the doctor's opinion. It's a definition of alcoholism. And and when I came in here, uh, I, you know, they had told me I had it. You know, it's, you know, it's like telling you you got crabs or telling you you're, you done stepped in doo-doo. You know you go, so, okay, I got it. What do you do now? What do you, what do you do now? Please, what do you do, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, I, I needed, I needed a system of how to approach this. You know, some of us come in here pretty confused, but we, we got a little bit of smarts with us, or we think we do anyway. You just need a little guidance. That's why they have sponsors waiting at the door for us. You know what I mean? They come on, I'm gonna show you how to do this. I mean, somebody go ask you to do it, and 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 it's no way in the world to, you know, uh, Dr. Silkworth was one of these people, just like Bill almost, that was divinely given to us. You know, he actually witnessed the first miracle. And uh, uh, one of the other things I want to suggest to you in the future, when you come to a big book study, bring a big book. <laughs> Bring one with you, right, Dennis? Where you? Where you? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but what I have done, I don't have enough of them for everybody, but I have some here. And in the breakouts, we'll share a little bit. Let's talk about, uh, let me give you one, Dennis. Let's talk about, uh, 
what Dr. Silkworth delivers to us in the big book. He actually witnessed the first the, the, the miracle that occurred in Dr. Bob, in Bill. He he actually witnessed it, and uh, it's very poignant how he put it. In the course of his third treatment of this guy, this guy had went to treatment three times. Back then, that's a big deal, okay? This guy acquired a certain, certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. Now, uh, I kind of break this down into a, l a little more um, figuratism. And, you know, actually, in my eyes, Bill was put in a rubber room for the third time. And just like Mike was talking about, he was trying to explain to his wife how hopeless he was. But while he was in that rubber room, something happened. And he came out of the rubber room, went to Dr. Siltworth, and said, hey, man, I need to talk to some more drunks. That just came out of nowhere. But Dr. Siltworth saw it happen because that's the guy who he came to and said, hey, man, I want to talk to another drunk. <laughs> and Dr. Siltworth, I mean, can you imagine now, this guy is on the verge of telling your wife, that you're hopeless. I mean, he puts it in the book. I came to regard this type of alcoholic as hopeless. And he comes out of the rubber room and says, Doc, I want to talk to another drunk. What do you think he does? He says, okay, go ahead. <laughs> do what you want to do. You're going to die. You're hopeless. Go right ahead. You, please, try whatever you need to try. I can't help you, bro. You know? That's what he did. I mean, it wasn't nothing, nothing, wasn't nothing, you know, you know, spiritual about that. I mean, you know, noticeably spiritual anyway. It was just at the moment, you know. I mean, back then they didn't have, you know, retreats where hundreds of guys working on alcoholism just voluntarily went. This guy came out of a rubber room saying, Doc, I need to talk to another drunk. He said, okay, go ahead. But then something else happened. The guy stopped drinking because he was talking to more drunks. And the doctor, you know, doctor's a scientist. Dr. Silkworth is a scientist. He had observed this. You know, and that's, that's one of the blessings of Dr. Silkworth is that he had observed it scientifically occur. And he documented it. It had been documenting it. And then he saw this miracle. And he documented it. You know, that's what he did. Uh... And, he, and, and when they got to the point where they wanted to write the book, you know, it's, it's guys um, around us that are just spiritually loving people that you will always love and you will always want them to be a part of your success. And after this guy that came out of the rubber room that I used to speak to, a drunk, had acquired a number of colleagues, about a hundred colleagues who had been successful at avoiding this craving and relieved this obsession to the extent that the doctor would consider them recovered, they were writing about what had happened. They were compiling uh, their experiences so as to even go further with it. And they came back to the doctor and said, Doc, we really have a lot of respect for you. You know who you understand us. That's another one of them great, uh, great ingredients to uh, beginning a recovery is that there must be someone that understands. And who better to understand than us? And who do we love? The people that understand. And they knew that Dr. Silkworth understood. So they asked him to put his piece in the book. Okay, and all Dr. Silkworth did was document scientifically what he had observed. It was a great place, a great place for him to be able to put his piece because now he's not talking to his colleagues as in the other two papers, his intellectual and scientific colleagues who he's trying to convince that there is a way to save an alcoholic because he was seeing bits and pieces of it. And then after the, after the first hundred started, he started being encouraged. And he started trying to tell his buddies that, look, these guys are actually beginning to get well. But nobody was listening. It was just academic fodder. You know how you publish a paper on how to get two of me with a mate and watch it and make it look pretty and they got it going on and they sent them in space and nobody wants to hear that gibberish. 
You know, none of the other scientists want to listen, especially if they're in denial about their own alcoholism. <laughs> you know? Uh, so it wasn't getting nowhere with them. And these guys came back and uh, if in to write a book. You know, I was, I got a buddy out here, David. David, uh, you know, he's, you know, in my mind, he's, uh, he's one of these intellectual guys. He's right here among us. He's writing a book. Okay? So, so what? Bill and wrote a book. You know, and they were writing a book. And, uh, they were inspired to write this book and begin to pass the message on. Okay? They were wanting to tell about the miracle. Go back to the rubber room. Go back to the drunk coming out. The first guy the drunk walks into when he comes out is this guy. <laughs> I want to talk to some old drunk. He said, hmm, try it. Let's see what happens. And he observed. A hundred of them begin to recover. And now they want to write a book, and they want him to put his stuff in it. So do, don't you know that this doctor wanted to take full advantage of his opportunity to define alcoholism to those who would need it most? His chance to, for posterity, document the definition of alcoholism for us, not for his medical colleagues, not for his academic friends, but for us. And it's right there in the front of the book, right after the forwards. So when I got here in 1986, January 31, I came to my first rock in February of that same year. And there are very few men here that were there then. One of them sitting right here, Mr. D. Uh, another one back there, me and Neil, I think, came the same time. But Skip back there, that's right, Skip, you came with us. You came from Roanoke, and now that's why we got the Roanoke connection. But when I got here in January 1986, I had not had a clue of what I was supposed to be doing. They had to put me in a little community of people. Now, wouldn't let me go no place by myself for two weeks, you know. I had to sneak and call my wife. Uh, and if I called her too many times, they were going to put me out. Uh, I had to go to three of these darn meetings a week, and I had to get a sponsor. Now, I'm from the hood. A sponsor supposed to pay your way. <laughs> now, I ain't seen nobody. I had guts enough to ask to do that. But I saw the guy that was going to be my sponsor standing up here, probably at this very podium. I'm talking about sponsorship. I got him to be my sponsor. Uh, then he sat me down and he said, we're going to work on what's killing you, what's killing you is alcoholism. And he got the cure right here and he showed me a book. He said, I want you to read the first 164 pages and call me. And one of the first things I read was the doctor's opinion. And then the next thing we did was talk about the doctor's opinion. And he told me that was the definition of alcoholism. You know, I'm a college-educated man. Um, I'd have read a lot of stuff. Uh, I was beat down by this disease. This disease is almost like, you know, a big, giant horsefly buzzing around you, biting you whenever it gets ready, and you're just too slow to catch it. And that's what it was doing to me. And I was beginning to suffer some serious wounds from the biting. And my sponsor defined that for me. Gave me a chance to understand what was happening to me. Um, I think somewhere in the doctor's opinion, they call it a special kind of suffering. That only we understand each other have. I can't find it, but... It's a particular kind of suffering that only we know. It's a nightmarish kind of suffering that only we know. Okay? And it's, it was a little relief to understand that there was a method to the nightmare that I might be able to wake up some kind of way. Because if, if, if it's a definition of it, it's a solution to it. And that gave me my first glimmer of hope. You know, okay, now, because there is a definition of alcoholism, doesn't necessarily mean that it apply to me. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm the great guy of denial. You know, I'm, I, you know, you know, I, my wife used to, the commercial used to say, um, if you got, if you need help from, from alcoholism, if you come, don't get it from us, get help somewhere, right? 
I used to go out and, say, and, and come back and tell my wife that the places that they wanted me to get help from cost too much money. And I hadn't even been, but I knew she was a cheapskate, so <laughs> if I told her that, she'd leave me alone. <laughs> it cost too much money. Fine, save your money. We'll figure out another way to save you. We'll wrap you up, you know, in one of the mummy suits that, uh, that uh, our friend uh, Jimmy used to talk about. Uh, anything to keep you from drinking. If it costs too much, we'll, we'll come up with a discount plan. Um, but, you know, I had no active way of coping with my disease. I didn't know what it was. I saw my granddaddy suffer. I saw my daddy suffer. And I saw countless friends suffer. I saw countless ones of their friends suffer. You know, um, I did think it was moral weakness. I did think it was badness. You know, I did think I was, uh, uh, as one of my friends used to say, snake bit. Roland Bryce would say snake bit. You know, and couldn't, couldn't get nothing right. Left home with the best intentions. <laughs> couldn't never get it done right. Just, you know, couldn't get it done right. And now they give us a definition. A definition is a good place to start. Let me tell you, gentlemen, if you have people that want you to help them with this disease, the best thing you could do is help them to understand the phenomenon of craving because it's undeniably understandable to an alcoholic. If he got what we got and you discuss the phenomenon of craving, he will understand. He might not yet be able to do anything about it, but he will now know. The ignorant okie doke is over. Now it's informed okie doke. Okay? Okay, we we not talk about informed okie doke. Once you understand that you suffer from the nom- phenomena of craving coupled with an obsession, and one of the other things that Dr. Silkworth talks about is, and some of the stuff that's happening now, even in in formalized treatment, is the physical attachment that we have to our disease. Not only the, the emotional and actually spiritual attachment that we have to our disease, but we do in fact have to be detoxified. We have to get the stuff off of us. You know, everything, you know, us who crave substances have to get them off of us before we can realize any kind of success at treating it. We have to get it off of us. That's why they tell you to stay clean. You know, stay clean. Get it off you. Because once it gets you, you're gone again. And, you know, talk about the phenomenon of craving. Like, uh, uh, or the allergy as if, you know, some allergies manifest themselves in itching. And and sometimes if you itch and you scratch, it goes away. But if you have the phenomenon, if you have this allergy that manifests itself in itching coupled with an obsession, the more you scratch it, the more you need to scratch it. So you could just be <laughs> scratching. And the more you scratch, the better it feels. And the better it feels, the more you scratch. And then you start gouging, you know, chunks of meat out you, but you can't stop. You know, that's what makes it so bad for us because we can't stop. I mean, that's serious business. To not be, you've never been in a car that couldn't stop? You match the brakes and they go faster? You know? I mean, it might be funny for a second or two. But, but that shit gets kind of serious after a minute. You start running over shit. And, you know? You start killing folk to save your own life. And that's what drunks do, man. With this, you, you be destroying lives because you're obsessed. Can't stop. And to know this is a breath of fresh air for a suffering drunk. To know this. To understand this. Is a breath of fresh air for, for a suffering drunk. It's a start. It ain't the end. You know, you don't get to the end. You don't get here and be done with it. You know, to know that if you start scratching, you can't stop. Or, you know, like, like, uh, Siegel is doing, if you got the phenomenon, you know, if you get digging in your nose as an allergy and then you can't stop, you've been stuck a hole in your brain. Before you can stop, you've been hurt somebody. You know, just imagine that, man. Just... <laughs> and you can't, I mean, you know, that that obsession to do it won't let you, anything. 
anything, man. You know. I mean, I got a buddy. We 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 got to feeling good about bowling, man. We bowl. We went on a bowling binge. <laughs> we bowled all over the metropolitan area of Atlanta. We bowled. Now I can't stand a bowling ball. <laughs> but we got to going, man. You know, two drunk junkies, man, that, that had a little bit of clean time, couldn't do nothing else, man. We was out all night. Wives were mad. Just the same old good stuff, you know. We just bowling. Wasn't even liquor. Wasn't even dope. We just bowling. <laughs> we, we bowled ourselves into the doghouse. It felt kind of good. We wasn't high. You know, it don't cost as much to bowl either. Just got to remember to give them back the shoes before you leave. <laughs> but I strongly, now what we're going to try to do, guys, is if you want, you know, it's almost midnight, it's, you know, 5 to 11, and some of us uh, don't hang as well as we used to. And I say us, I say us inclusively, you know. But uh, we'd like to break off in a, in a few groups, uh, a couple of groups, two or three groups. Um, if you want to talk about specifically some of the text in the doctor's opinion, we'd be more than happy to do that for a minute. Uh, what I'd ask is that we uh, form a couple of circles, get kind of intimate so we could talk about it. Um, Michael will take one group and I'll take the other. And uh, we'll sit here and we'll, and we'll talk about it for a minute. I have about 20 of these things. I, I should have got more. Actually, I don't know why I didn't think we should need more than this. Um, but uh, we got them. And, uh, you know, actually, if you got a big book, just go get it and bring back that, you know, go get it and flip to the page, call the doctor's opinion, and we can talk in depth about it. We, what we really want to do is, you know, get a, get a rhythm going, you know, from retreat to retreat or every other retreat or so where, we we study some of the text of our of our big book and uh, and 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 take some understanding back to our respective groups and uh, communities and uh, halfway houses or wherever we are, just in, instead of just you know conjecture and what I think and what some sponsor that ain't never read the damn thing told me about you know so. Uh, uh, that's fine. However, however we want to do it, we got yeah. We probably will need about four groups. So we we have a couple other guys here that, uh, if they want, uh, could kind of help lead a group for us, um, and uh, we'll do that for a few minutes or if, for however long uh, you guys could go without nodding out. How about that? I'd like to thank y'all very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.